infrared, for example, travels in slightly longer wavelengths. Infrared radiation is through the dust because its wavelengths are longer and the dust just kind of rides on the infrared wave. In the 1960s, Becklin bought an infrared detector from a military contractor and attached it to the end of a telescope. It was in August of 1966, and it was a beautiful night. As we were looking uh, with the infrared detector, uh, we were seeing more and more stars, and the signal increased, and each star gives you more signal, and we were building up, as we were getting closer to the center, more and more stars. We were actually seeing through the dust for the first time, and then came to a peak, and then back down again. And I knew immediately that that was the center of our Milky Way, and that I was the first person to actually see the stars in the very core of our galaxy. Eric Becklin had discovered the very heart of the Milky Way, the exact location of the mysterious energy source. But its staggering power meant that this was no ordinary star. Scientists believe the only one thing that could explain the mystery was the very idea that Einstein had rejected, an object that defies explanation. What's a black hole? It's this monstrous, mysterious thing. It's a point of infinite density. We don't know how to wrap our brains around that. It's a region where space and time have closed in on itself. A black hole is a region of space where the pull is, uh, of gravity is so immense that not even light can escape it. You reach the point where light cannot even come out. And if light can't come out, you're not coming out. And if light plus you are not coming out, it's a black hole. There's no other phrase we can possibly use to describe it. Welcome to the strange world of extreme physics where space and time literally cascade into the abyss. Space itself is falling inside the black hole. It's rather like a, a river falling over a waterfall, except it's space itself that's falling over the cliff. It's rather like a kayaker trying to make their way upstream on a river that's going too fast. They get dragged down to the center of the black hole. Gravity becomes a riptide. The closer you get, the stronger the current. Eventually, you reach the event horizon, the point of no return. Matter goes inside the surface of the black hole, shrinks down to the very center where it gets destroyed in a region of infinite warp space and time, and it's gone. gravity at your feet, if that goes to the black hole, is a little bit stronger than the gravity of your head, and you feel that as something that is tearing you apart. The tidal forces unrelentingly getting stronger as they exceed the molecular forces that bind your flesh. And so you end up moving through space-time like toothpaste through a tube. Ultimately, you will pull your atoms apart. You will be, as we say. As strange as they are, black holes are a product of the familiar universe of stars and gravity. They have their genesis in a type of enormous star called a red supergiant. It is ten times heavier than our sun, yet it will burn itself out in a fraction of the sun's lifetime. Inside, the crush of gravity sends temperatures roaring above a billion degrees. Helium and carbon fuse into heavier elements. Oxygen, silicon, sulfur. Then, the star implodes under its own immense gravity, sending a shockwave roaring out. The star digs itself deeper into space travel, and now goes supernova in a violent explosion. What's left is a dense core of subatomic particles, a neutron star, only about 16 kilometers across. It's so dense, 
that a teaspoonful of neutron star matter would weigh about a billion tons. Eventually, the gravitational pressure will be so large that the neutrons themselves will be crushed and there'll be nothing left to stop the collapse. A black hole is born. It's a million times the mass of the Earth, but compressed so tightly, it literally exits the known universe. Now, the effect of that mass is still in our universe. The mass is still here in that it's causing this fold in space that goes all the way down. It's become a hole. The best way to look at it is, if you stick your finger down in there, you ain't getting it back. We know exactly what effect a black hole is going to have on its environment, on the stars in its vicinity on the gas that wanders a little too close. So, will we ever see a black hole? No. But that's not what's important here. What's important here is we can see its paw print. In search of a black hole's paw print, Eric Becklin is on a lifelong quest to probe the center of our galaxy. is a supermassive black hole at its center. And the key to answering this most definitively is to watch stars at the center of the galaxy orbiting. Gens's team set up at the newly built Keck telescope on the summit of Hawaii's Mauna Kea volcano, the largest telescope ever built. Our view to the center of the galaxy is absolutely superb. Our ability to position stars the center of the galaxy is like somebody in Los Angeles seeing somebody in New York be able to move their finger like this, okay, just two centimeters. That's the precision with which we can measure something that is 26,000 light years away from us. Madeline, we're ready to go. The conclusive experiment to be done that really demonstrated that it was a black hole was to follow the orbits of individual stars very, very accurately and with the highest precision possible. But the stars in the center of the galaxy were not the only thing Getz and Becklin had to keep track of. Another group working in the mountains of Chile was hot on the same trail, led by Reinhard Gensel from Germany. This guy here is a little too dense to be just a random collection. We suspect that in the galactic center they may be hiding uh, very massive black holes. To really be sure that there are black holes, we have to go in there as close as we can. We can make measurements really good enough now that we can say it must be a black hole. Both teams wanted to be the first to prove that our galaxy harbors a supermassive black hole, but Gensel and his team had a three-year head start. The amazing precision of Keck is the ace in the hole for Gens and her team. Mark Morris is a veteran of the Galactic Center Search. The German group had already started to make headway on the Galactic Center, even while we were deciding to pursue this. So we knew that in, if, in a head-to-head -head competition, that as long as they were using the small 2.2-meter telescope that they were using, compared to our 10-meter telescope, that uh, we would blow them away. Bright speck on the top of this insert. That's the star which really has given us the essential clue. It was certainly high excitement, but on the other hand, have to compile like at least five years of data before we could see the stars move. But what kind of cosmic monster was pulling the stars along? This is our roadmap. And that's the center of our galaxy. There's a large
large cluster of stars that are orbiting the center of our galaxy. Basically, the way this experiment works is you take an image, you see where all the stars are, and then uh, you come back some time later and you take another image and you look to see if they've moved. So the second time we took an image, we knew time we took an image, we knew we were um, uh, golden. That those stars had clearly moved. The first order of business was to see how large the object is, to weigh it by measuring its gravity. So we have the black hole here, and then the more massive it is, the more pull there is. The more pull there is, as it gets close to the black hole, the faster it goes. And we are measuring the speed of these stars. That's the key to getting the masses, measuring the speed of those stars. Andrea's more advanced telescope made the difference. The object weighed in at a staggering three million times that of our sun. But that didn't prove it's a black hole. It could still be a cluster of smaller objects. For the Germans, it was time to leave the playing field. The VLT, Very Large Telescope, opened its doors on a mountain in Chile. Both the VLT and Keck were upgraded with revolutionary technology. For years, the teams relied on computers to pinpoint the location of stars through the turbulence of our atmosphere. Now, they could cancel it out with a new system known as adaptive optics. It uses a powerful laser beam to read the turbulence. Telescope operators can use those readings to sharpen the image of distant stars and galaxies. So this little animation shows you the benefit of adaptive optics. So you see the stars without adaptive optics, you turn the adaptive optics on, and all of a sudden you see stars. And in particular, you see stars near the center of the galaxies. We track all of them, but these are the ones that are the key to the problem. These new eyes were delivered just in time. With both teams watching, one of the stars made a dramatic hairpin turn around the center. In 2002, it made a huge jump to over here. So it went whoop, all the way around. The okay. star was initially going very slowly and then moving around very quickly and at that point coming very, very close to the central black hole. And it's moving on order 10 million miles per hour, so it's just speeding away. The star had come close enough for the teams to see that it had to be circling a single massive object. All other physical explanations of uh, what was at the very center uh, we're gone. The only thing left was a black hole. To astronomers around the world, the evidence was impressive. I have to say, when I first saw Andrea's video, I was stunned when I saw that star come out of the left side of the frame and go zipping around and go shooting off into the other end of the frame, and it moved around a point in space, and nothing was there. That we could, with our uh, instruments, together with our minds, effectively travel to the center of the galaxy 26,000 light years away and collect the evidence for such an incredible object was really an amazing achievement. The European and American teams had confirmed that a black hole was there without actually seeing it. From our quiet corner at the far edge of our galaxy's spiral, it's hard to imagine the violence at its center. The closer you draw toward the center, the denser it gets. Our destination, the galaxy's central hub, brimming with stars, known simply as the Bulge. Venture into the Bulge, and you enter a busy highway. It's jammed with star traffic, speeding in every direction, and it's always rush hour. There's a lot of gas. There's a lot of dust. This is absolutely the most crowded place in our galaxy. There will be stars all around us, an incredible density of stars. I mean, we couldn't exist there. There's lots of ultraviolet radiation, x-rays are floating around, gas clouds bash into each other, a lot of activity. It's a very hostile environment, really. The black hole is surrounded by a cloud of super hot gas that's falling in. The space around the black hole is so warped, it distorts the light that scatters across it. 
As bizarre as it seems, the gravity of a supermassive black hole is so spread out that you might fall in and survive for a moment. During the final descent, you would then go into the event horizon, but you would actually not feel it um, because you are a small body compared to the large massive black hole. Now, thanks to a computer simulation based on Einstein's own equations, we can visualize the scene. As you move toward the black hole's core, you hit an inner horizon, a log jam of trapped light and energy. At a certain moment, as we hit the inner horizon, there's this infinitely bright, blinding flash of light. That's all the stuff that's been waiting there, trying to get out, is just held there at the inner horizon. It would vaporize you. Almost certainly, if you fell into a real black hole, you would simply, unfortunately, die. But that's not the end of the journey. The computer storm can be turned off, and the strange predictions of Einstein's equations allowed to play out. A passageway opens up, a tunnel through space and time known as a wormhole. We now leave through a strange door known as a white hole. Here, the twisted logic of extreme gravity goes into reverse. Instead of being sucked in, you would be catapulted out to the far reaches of time and space. But to where? In science fiction, wormholes offer handy escape routes to other universes. In reality, the inside of a black hole is probably too chaotic and violent for a wormhole ever to form. The black hole at the center of the Milky Way is strange enough as it is. But is it the norm? Or is our galaxy a freak of nature? To find out, Astronomers have mounted a major international project to search galaxies throughout the universe for evidence of supermassive black holes. From Apache Point in New Mexico, astronomers are probing big galaxies out to a billion light years from Earth. They take a series of steel plates and drill holes to exactly match the location of galaxies in the night sky. Then they plug fiber optic sensors into those holes and for the first time ever, they can use the plates to capture the light of hundreds of galaxies per night. The astronomers are looking for a distinctive light signature coming from a galaxy's core. It's a sign of hot gas swirling into a black hole. The goal of the project, called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, is to map a quarter of the entire northern sky to find out what kind of galaxies make up our universe and how they are arranged. Of the 125 billion galaxies that make up the visible universe, more than a million have so far been analyzed. Nearly all the large ones, circled in red, bear the signature of a supermassive black hole. The closer we look to the centers of galaxies, the more we find these black holes, and the inventory is rising high. So any idea for the formation of a galaxy will now have to include some explanation for how you get a black hole in its center. But how did every big galaxy in the universe end up with a giant black hole in the middle? To understand, go back to the very beginning. The Big Bang. Matter and energy rush outward as the universe expands. So you got the Big Bang handing you your birth ingredients, your hydrogen, your helium, your, your traces of some other elements. So it's kind of like this, this soup. You put it together and stir it. It's gravity that stirs the soup. Over billions of years, it molds the universe into a spider's web of gas and galaxies. Within this web, gravity draws together wisps of hot, primordial gas. 
Over tens of millions of years, the clouds of hydrogen gas coalesce, growing more and more dense. Some grow hot enough to ignite. The first stars are born, giants, hundreds of times bigger than our sun. They burn out quickly and explode in the flash of a supernova. Billions of years later, an orbiting satellite called SWIFT is in position to capture that flash of light. SWIFT is the eyes of an international group of astronomers. Within 30 seconds of detecting a flash, it sends out an alert via mobile phones, pages, and emails. Adam Mikeford calling. We have a GRB detection. Please meet me at the observatory and call the GRB team. The astronomers scramble to their telescopes. Speed is vital. They have to catch the light beam if they are to probe the dark secrets behind these distant disasters. First, they determine how far it has traveled, give it a name, and pinpoint its birth galaxy. Then we're gonna need to move the dome, Casey. By analyzing the light, they have gleaned the distinctive signatures of black holes being born. The most distant are the earliest generation of primordial monsters. We could be forming the seed of the supermassive black holes that we see in galaxies today very early on, when the very first uh, objects form in the universe. We can now, with our big telescopes, look back in time. And, sh and sure enough, what we find is that at the same time when the galaxies form, also the black holes form, it may very well be that they needed each other. This computer simulation shows how our Milky Way galaxy was born. grew over billions of years from a swarm of smaller galaxies smashing together, merging. In a cosmic dance of death, the infant galaxies swirl around and orbit one another, gravity pulling them closer. If another galaxy comes too close, they will each feel each other's gravity. What started out as a stately ballet of stellar orbits moving around the center of their galaxy has now become this this maelstrom there's no other way to say it galactic cannibalism that's what they're doing they're dining on their neighbors eating entire galaxies well for every galaxy you eat if that galaxy has a black hole in its center it's going to eat the black hole and the black hole will work its way down to the center of the large galaxy making the center of the galaxy bigger as well as the galaxy itself. As galaxies swallow each other, the black holes of their centers merge and grow. And there was an epoch once, about one, two, three billion years after the Big Bang, when in fact galaxies were forming, or at least they were tremendously more active than now. And at the same time, Black holes already existed, had formed, and were fed at, at, tr at tremendous rates, producing very powerful quasars. Quasars are bright beacons of light at the centers of distant galaxies, where feeding black holes shine brighter than anything else in the universe. The Hubble Space Telescope peered into a dormant quasar in a nearby galaxy called M87. It found a tiny central region where gas is heated to tens of millions of degrees and whipped by gravity to millions of kilometers per hour. What it became obvious was that there was a tremendous amount of mass in a very small volume, but that mass was very unlikely to be stars like those stars that we see in our galaxy. Astronomer Brian McNamara believes giant ravenous black holes can have a profound effect on the surrounding galaxy and beyond. Now, can we get an offset? Oh, 180. 180, 180, same direction. We are setting at uh, 
360-360. Guider is locked up. McNamara is studying a trail of devastation left in their wake. Isn't that amazing? All of these other galaxies are gravitationally bound. All of these other galaxies are gravitationally bound to this galaxy cluster. So they're all uh, buzzing around this giant galaxy like bees buzzing around a hive. These clusters are the product of galactic cannibalism on a cosmic scale. This computer simulation shows how a galaxy cluster evolves in a dense region of the universe, tens of millions of light years across. Hundreds of galaxies form, then swarm toward a common center. A central galaxy swallows them up. As it grows, so does the black hole. McNamara is searching for the monster's paw print. So that's a giant galaxy sitting in the middle of a, a cluster of galaxies. So the idea is that that's a big galaxy and right down at the center you can't see it. We think there's probably a black hole that's got a mass that approaches a billion suns. It very recently in the last um, uh, several uh, tens of millions of years gobbled up a lot of matter and it uh, caused a huge eruption. McNamara zeroes in on a distant galaxy cluster, two and a half billion light years away. Also Called MSO7, it's hidden in a vast cloud of hot gas. There's an atmosphere of gas um, that pervades the entire galaxy cluster. And it's an atmosphere like our atmosphere, except that it's far less dense and it's, and it's um, much, much hotter. McNamara noticed that two immense cavities in this cloud had been hollowed out. In that cavity here, in this cavity here, we could stuff 600 Milky Ways in there. It's just astonishing. The energy involved is huge. McNamara believes this eruption of energy is the most powerful since the Big Bang itself. He traces its source to the core of the giant central galaxy, a supermassive black hole. But how does a black hole, a creature famous for devouring everything within its grasp, spew energy across the universe? As matter falls in, um, what we know now is that it spirals around in a disk, okay, very much the way when water goes down the drain. And the speeds that matter can, can achieve around that black hole approach the speed of light. And when matter travels at that speed, it gets a tremendous amount of energy. Matter falling into a black hole is a lot of stuff trying to get into a very small place. And so it's like trying to fill a dog dish with a fire hose. Most isn't going to get in. A high-speed whirlpool of matter coils around the black hole, creating a powerful magnetic field that hurls enormous volumes of gas outward. It produces a powerful jet of matter, hundreds of millions of times the power of the sun, that blasts right out of the galaxy. There's no question that the black holes at the centers of galaxies have a profound influence on their surrounding. They send out these huge jets moving at almost the speed of light. And those jets can send shock waves into the surrounding medium, change their surroundings completely. They have a dramatic influence. These jets can literally sterilize the galaxy by halting the formation of new stars. In principle, galaxies can grow um, to very, very large sizes. And what we see in the universe is that they don't. And we think that the supermassive black holes at the center may be the culprit. They may be responsible um, for preventing runaway growth of galaxies. In smaller galaxies, all this violence can have a creative impact. Black hole blast waves spread heavy elements generated in the core of the galaxy, setting the stage for the formation of new solar systems. We usually think of black holes as God's dumpster, but they really are actors on the galactic stage. The monster of the Milky Way may have helped create our solar system, but what's to stop it from wiping us out? It all depends on the monster's diet.
One of the key differences between um, galaxies with supermassive black holes is whether or not their black holes are lit up because they're basically binging on a lot of material, material in its surroundings. For years, our own black hole has probably been fasting. But in 1999, the Chandra Space Telescope detected a powerful signal from the galactic center. Uh, station 34, Chandra OC. Just to let you know, we have about 18 minutes remaining in the playback. An explosion just outside the event horizon.